Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, believe it or not, the best Beethoven string quartet cycles. Boy, has this been a project. All I can tell you is Beethoven wrote 16 string quartets, and I have chosen 16 string quartet cycles to talk about as representative. All of them are extremely good. They really are. This is an almost impossible thing. It just comes down to your own personal choice because the Beethoven quartets are so iconic. They are so well known. Every string quartet in the world that is worthy of the name plays the Beethoven string quartets. And many of them, many times many of them, <coughs> excuse me, have recorded complete cycles of them. And often very, very well. The quality of work in the Beethoven string quartets probably is as, is as high as you will find anywhere in all of music. I mean, quartets, when they undertake Beethoven cycles, take them very, 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 very seriously. And you, you got that, I'm sure, by the third very. You knew where we were going with this. And so they tend to do their best work. Are they all equally perfect? No. Are they all equally interesting and desirable? No. But you can always count on the ensembles to really, really give their best. And as a result of that, it's really difficult to find bad Beethoven string quartet cycles, although you can find you know, less interesting individual performances. A lot of the controversy or, or criticism of specific string quartets and their Beethoven cycles come simply from the way that they play as a quartet, from their approach to the music, not because they haven't done their best work as a quartet, if you know what I mean. The difference is one of perspective. So what I've done is I've kind of lumped these things in different groups depending on, on where they come from and how the quartets play or what school they belong to. These are all extreme generalities. I want to say that straight off. I mean, we're talking about gross generalizations, and there is no way within a normal span of time that I can talk about each of these cycles and play samples and all that stuff. I, it's just not possible. So I, I want you to understand that if you want really detailed reviews, look at the reviews of Beethoven string quartet cycles on classicstoday.com. It's a wonderful resource for this sort of thing. For this talk, I want to sort of tell you what my favorite ones are, what I think some of the best ones are, and what kind of general performance performance parameters you may have in mind when you go through them. So I'm going to start. I'm going to start with my top five. We're not going to wind up with it. I will give you my however choice at the end. So there's something to wait for. But I just want to start with the top five just so you know where they are. And then we'll talk about others and sort of see where they slot in to that, to that, uh, to those parameters that I outlined in the top five. So First, the Juilliard Quartet. This is their this is their analog cycle. It was recorded. Oh, I don't know. It tells you here. What what was it? 1964 to 1970. Now these performances are extremely important in the history of Beethoven quartets because they created what was sometimes called the American quartet style. Wrongly, I believe, but that's another issue. These are exciting modern, lean, almost in some respects anti-romantic uh, because the group that they were triangulating their sound against was the Budapest Quartet. And the Budapest Quartet we'll come to in a moment, but these were supposed to be determinedly so, a different take on the Beethoven Quartets, a little bit more objective, perhaps a little swifter, and at a technical level that we had not yet encountered in this music. And that is absolutely true in terms of intonation and accent and balance and rhythm. These performances have a tautness about them that is absolutely wonderful and which created an entirely new school of string quartet playing and particularly of interpreting the Beethoven quartets. And so we'll, we'll see where that went because so many of the modern quartet performances that we hear 
really are based on what the Juilliard first did. And that includes period instrument performances, but although there is no there is no great period instrument performance Beethoven quartet cycle. There just isn't. And for good reason, I think. But uh, that's that's a whole nother topic, I think. But the Juilliard Quartet is one of those iconic sets that really belongs in every collection. And here it is. This is the 64 to 70 analog cycle. Because like everybody, they remade them. So that's that one. Next, these are in no order. Remember, the Takash Quartet. Now, the Takash Quartet is the modern avatar of just a glorious, glorious tradition of Hungarian string quartets playing this music. And they do it superbly well. All of the modern string quartets, I would say, have a touch of Juilliard in them to the extent that that because the technical level had been raised so high, the bar had been raised so high, no modern quartet can get away with some of the some of the lapses in intonation or you know rhythmic slackness or occasional imprecision that we heard in some of these earlier quartet cycles. So this is fabulously well played, beautifully recorded, and absolutely gorgeous, a fantastic modern Beethoven Quartet Cycle, which uh, has given me enormous pleasure. It's also extraordinarily consistent across all 16 works. They do them all with sort of equal, equal uh, interpretive mastery and intelligence. It's very, very fine. So that's that one. Next, Quartetto Italiano. Oh, yes. The Quartetto Italiano sounds like the Quartetto Italiano. They are the apotheosis of polish, elegance, aristocratic finish, taste allied with emotion, passion, Italianate lyricism, that fabulous singing tone, that gorgeous, gorgeous, slightly bottom-heavy sonority, just fantastic cello playing moderate tempos. Some people feel that they're better in the later quartets, the middle and late quartets, than the Opus 18 quartets. I disagree with that, but that's that's still, this is absolutely one of the great, great, great Beethoven quartet cycles. So the Italiano is always on my short list. That's number three. Number four, the Leipzig Quartet on MD and G. Now, the Leipzig Quartet is just a, a tremendous quartet in the, in the great German tradition of quartet playing. Beethoven quartets, of course, are their meat and potatoes stuff. These recordings on the MD and G label are exquisitely beautiful. And it's very interesting because just today, as I was getting ready to do this talk, I was, I was driving home and on the radio was the Cavatina from this quartet cycle. So I guess I wasn't the only one who thinks this is a terrific Beethoven quartet cycle. And it's even better to hear the Cavatina within the context of the entire quartet in which it belongs. Beautiful, beautiful performances. And in this particular box, you also get the string quintets, Opus 4 and Opus 29. Um, it's really, it's really a marvelous, marvelous effort from a fabulous quartet. They're just great. And MD and G does such wonderful work technically. The sonics are just fantastic. So this is worth considering. And it's going to stick around, you know, because we hopefully, because it's not a major label where everything goes out of print or gets reissued or reboxed or fudged with. So that's really a wonderful thing to consider. Also, ah, yes. And we have, last but not least, by any stretch of the imagination, the Smetna Quartet on Superfon, part of the great tradition of Czech string quartets doing Beethoven string quartets. This is just glorious, fabulous, marvelous, marvelous, marvelous music making. The dates of these, let me see if I can see this. It's so difficult to, to read any of this stuff on the back of these things. Here we go. Recorded in Prague, 1976 to 1985, and they are absolutely fabulous. These are the analog recordings. There was on Denon another cycle, but uh, these are just great. These are as great as it gets in the Beethoven Quartet's playing of amazing energy and rhythmic aptitude and gorgeous balance and flawless intonation and just great emotional, emotional intelligence and intensity. It's fantastic. Fan, just fantastic. You can enjoy every bar of every quartet. So those are my top five. And we'll get to the 
best of the batch in my view. And this changes. I have to say, any of these top five could be my best of the batch on any given day. But I, in preparing this talk, uh, I did I did pick one. So we'll get to the one that I picked. Now, having done those top five and knowing what they are, let's start talking about the other 11 string quartet cycles that we have here to make our total of 16 cycles, one for each quartet, and we'll see where it takes us. First, I do want to talk about the Hungarian string quartet tradition, which is, which is just amazing. It really is, especially in Beethoven. You'd think that Beethoven would be the specialty of all the German quartets, you know? And there are lots of German quartets, and of course they all play Beethoven. But on records, that is not the case. Hungarian string quartets were something special, particularly up until, up until say, the 1960s or 70s. They had a certain Hungarian string playing. It's like Hungarian conducting. I've talked about this in, in, in conjunction with Ferenc Fritschoy and sometimes Ivan Fischer, sometimes, and some of these other Hungarian musicians. They have a, an inherent soulfulness and warmth and humanity in their playing, which is just extraordinary and which really suits these Beethoven quartets, especially the slow movements with that, that intense singing lyricism, that profundity that Beethoven writes into them. And for that reason, they were the groups that essentially were the, were the messengers of the Beethoven Quartet ethos for many, many, many years, for decades, especially in the middle of the 20th century. And I have three more, three more sets by Hungarian string quartets. First, the Budapest Quartet. Now this is their stereo cycle. They did two. There was a mono cycle and a stereo cycle. By general consensus, the mono cycle is technically better. They were a bit younger. They were in slightly better form. There are a few intonational jiggles here and there, but still, you get you very much get that that wonderful old world we call it now. I don't know what that really means, but that 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 general Central European warmth, that that knowledge of being in the idiom, and effortlessly expressing, you know, the the, the passion behind the music. And the Budapest Quartet is just a wonderful group. And these were the standard, the standard in Beethoven quartets, really until the Juilliard came along. And one of the reasons that the Juilliard had to wait till 1964 to do their first Beethoven cycle uh, was because this one was, ar was around. And they were afraid slightly that people would say, well, you know, I mean, this is not the Budapest. So there's the Budapest Quartet. We'll put that one over there. I've got piles of quartets all around me here. Then there was the Hungarian Quartet, which I don't think is quite as good as the Budapest Quartet, but which is still a very fine group, and it's still audibly in that tradition. This is this is on reissued on Erato this week. God knows where it will be next week, depending on what on what Warner does. But another very fine group. Another group reared in that wonderful Central European tradition of quartet playing and string playing more generally that was always, always wonderfully warm and humane and just, I keep saying humane, human, whatever, but that's, that's what it is. These, these quartets have to sing. The violin particularly sings. It's, it's the most vocal of all the musical instruments in terms of its ability to recreate the range of of passion and emotion of which the human voice is capable. And that's what these quartets tried to bring out, even at the expense of technical perfection. That is particularly true of the Weig Quartet, run by Chandor Weig at the top, who was a fantastic musician, as I never tire of saying, an incredible musician, someone who, who injected life and warmth into everything he ever conducted and anything he ever played. He was not technically the best guy out there. He did have some intonational issues, especially in the late quartets. In this cycle, this is their stereo cycle. They also did a mono cycle. So there are two of them. The mono cycle is technically a bit better. I have it sitting over there somewhere. But the stereo recordings are, are, are really so much better sonically and of course, you know, you could argue that there is an extra maturity and depth to what they all do, especially in the late quartets, um, that's really quite marvelous. But for that reason, some might find them a bit wanting in the Opus 18 quartets. 
which um, are played with perhaps a little bit a little bit too much sense of relaxation and maybe quartet like chumminess you know but you know they could be more taut they could be more periody I mean the way we think about that music now tends to be a lot a lot sharper than these performances but they're still marvelous performances it's tremendous musicianship by any standard and so these three groups the Budapest the Hungarian and above all the vague quartet are are iconic representatives of the Hungarian school of Beethoven quartet playing. But there is also a Czech, a Czech school. We saw the Smetna Quartet. And the other major, major, major representative is the Talich Quartet here on, on Calliope, um, or Calliope, or whatever you want to call it. Now probably La Dolce Volta, since that catalog has been sold. An extraordinarily wonderful, wonderful group. The Czech quartets also had a very, very special sound. I don't think it was any less warm or any less passionate than the Hungarian groups. They had an extra, an extra brightness to the timbre, I think, an extra sharpness of rhythm, but always with an exquisitely beautiful tone. You hear that in all of these groups. You hear it with the Smetna, you hear it with the Talich Quartet, you hear it with, for example, the Pinocchio Quartet, who don't have a Beethoven cycle, but I'm just talking about the school of quartet playing. They're able to achieve wonderful, wonderful, bright, vivid accents without ever coarsening the tone. And that, to me, is, is such a, a fabulous, fabulous goal of quartet playing. I always listen for that when I play this music. And so the Talik Quartet is also a fabulous group, well worth considering. So those are kind of like the big schools. And of course, there is the German school. We'll talk about a bit more. Well, let's talk about another one now in the German school. This is not one of the iconic quartet performances, but let's lead off our discussion of the other one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven more quartet cycles um, and see where they fit into all of these different possible, possible parameters that we've outlined. So first, on Brilliant Classics, very inexpensive and very good and very underrated, the Siska Quartet. Now, Carl Siska, um, Siska, yes, that's his name, Carl Siska, uh, was a, it is, I, know, I think he's still around, um, I hope, is a, a splendid, splendid violinist. He was concertmaster of the Leipzig Gewandhaus, of the Berlin Staatskapelle. He, he had a wonderful career. He was at the, the Gewandhaus Quartet, an amazing chamber music musician. And this is the quartet he formed. It was in East Germany, so it did not get as much play here in the West as it probably deserved to. And also, because it was in East Germany, it wasn't one of those major company, you know, do all the quartets in one session type thing. This particular cycle took about 11 years, from 1969 to 1980. And when quartets take their time, as the Juilliard did the first time around too, I often think the results are better. I really do. I think it always helps to take your time and especially in music of this depth and this quality. You, you know, you don't you don't want to dash through it. Nowadays people just release cycles, you know, it's like, oh here, have seven discs of Beethoven quartets. And I think the result sometimes tells. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But I really think that this quartet, the Suska Quartet on Brilliant Classics is, is a wonderful, wonderful group. And they deserve consideration, especially at the price. So that's worth thinking about. And that's part of the really fine German tradition of quartet playing. Now, a couple of mo there's a modern quartet. This is the Belsia Quartet on Alpha. A wonderful group, just a fine modern string quartet. You don't want to talk about whether they belong to a particular school or not. They belong to the school of Belsia, and they do a superb job in the quartets. I think that these performances are among the best of all the young quartets that are out there. They are, they are um, intelligent, they are tasteful, they're exciting, they have a very good sense of all three major groups of quartets, the early, the middle, and the late, and they're wonderfully recorded and presented on the Alpha label. So Belsia is worth considering. It's been a fun cycle to follow. 
Next, let's see. Ah, we have to mention the Alban Berg Quartet. Now, they too have done two Beethoven Quartet cycles, or they did. One was digital, one was analog. This is the analog one. You want the analog one. It's much better than the digital one. It's much better technically, sonically. The digital one was sort of early digital. I think it was live early digital. We talked about it in the big Alban Berg Quartet box review that I did for you guys a while back. So, you know, these are audibly in the tradition of the Juilliard Quartet. And I don't know if they'd admit it or not. I don't really care. That's what they are. They are that extremely high degree of finish, somewhat lean, somewhat fleet tempo-wise, serious precision all the way. And of course, they claim, well, they bring a Viennese warmth to the American technical polish. You know, the, the, drivel, the drivel and bullshit is endless when it comes to describing these performances. But these are modern performances of that Juilliard school. They really are. And if they have something Viennese in there, good for them. I mean, you know, wonderful. It doesn't take anything away from the quality of the performance to tell the truth once in a while and admit that that, that was the proximate inspiration for the style of playing on offer here. And they are wonderful. They're every bit as good as the Juilliards and some would say better. I, I have no issue with anyone who, you know, simply, simply displays a preference one way or another. They're, either way, they're marvelous. And, but remember, analog, not digital. Keep that in mind. Next, the Guarnieri Quartet. Now, the Guarnieri was one of many groups that popped up in the wake of the Juilliard Quartet um, that made a wonderful reputation for themselves and that are recognizably in that sort of American style of playing, that wonderfully finished and polished style. So I don't need to talk about them a lot. The question of whether or not you like these or like prefer them to another version simply comes down to how you feel about these players and whether you like their collective sound and the collective decisions they make interpretively. That's something for everyone to choose for themselves. Two more in the style, I think, at least two more, yeah, three more, I don't know, in the Juilliard style. We see that there is a modern quartet style sort of evolving out there. The Tokyo Quartet. Another splendid, splendid group. This was a group that for a while threatened to out Juilliard the Juilliards, just in terms of their their incredible, incredible technical finish. But also it's technical finish that never comes at the expense of, I think, interpretive excellence and intelligence and musicality and emotional intensity. I, I am one of those people, and I'm sure you know this by now, who does not believe in the trade-off. You know, you, you hear it in the old stupid Toscanini versus Fort Wengler thing about how, well, one is passionate and emotional and flexible and spontaneous, and the other is technical and, and rigid and mechanical. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. There is sloppiness, and there is precision, and there is musicality, which should be allied to both. This is not a zero-sum game that we're playing here. Every single performance that is great should have every single quality. The proportions are different. The recipe may be different, but those qualities have to be there. And the expressive dimension of the Beethoven quartets has to be in every performance, whether you are emphasizing technical precision or whether you are emphasizing spontaneity of expression over all other factors. I happen to believe in balance and proportion. And I think Beethoven did too, even in his wackiest inspirations. There is always, always a firm discipline and controlling mind at work behind the music. And so these are excellent performances and uh, you might you might prefer them. I don't know. It's up to you. They're very, very good. Similar, it's similar in that school is the Emerson Quartet which is a tremendous group. They take so much crap. I, I've, I, I be, you know, I think maybe just because there were too many excellent American quartets out there all doing this music. And here's yet another one that has an enormous degree of technical polish and people listen to it and don't pay attention. 
They just don't pay attention. They just say, ah, oh, well, you know, it sounds kind of Juilliardy. It's another American quartet. Of course, the playing's very good, but we miss the soul. I can't stand comments like that. The soul is here. Trust me. You get soul. You get filet of soul. You get grouper. You get Chilean sea bass. You get all of the varieties of fish that you could possibly want in your Beethoven quartets. These are very, very, very good performances, and they deserve our respect and admiration, and they may touch you more deeply than any of the others. Go try them out. Finally, in our other group of others, another modern group, which is quite, quite splendid, um, the Miro Quartet. Uh, on pentatone. This is another very, very beautifully recorded cycle by an unbelievably talented young modern quartet. You can see it's modern because they have they have abstract blotchy things instead of, you know, either old black and white photos or, you know, portraits of Beethoven. You know, that's how you can tell they're more traditional. And this is how you can tell they're modern because they have colored blobs, but four of them, get it? It's a quartet. You know, I wonder who the little blob is. I don't know. All I know is that these pentatone recordings are extremely fine. Um, this is a quartet that I have to admit, their sound is not always to my taste. Their collective sound, I find their sonority to be, um, I, I don't know what the word is, maybe a little bit, a little bit slick, a little bit lacking in, 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 uh, color. I don't know. And color. They got color on the cover. I don't know. I don't know. I could listen to these all over again and probably be more precise in my description of them. But it, my taste doesn't really matter, in, except in picking the one that I like the best. These are very, very fine performances by a major, major young quartet that deserves to be heard. And they deserve to be heard in Beethoven. So this is another cycle that some of you may really, really enjoy, especially, you know, those of you who are newer to this music and haven't listened to 475 quartet cycles. Chances are you're going to get the Emersons or Miro or Belsia. You'll get these groups first because they're the ones that are out there. And I just want you to know you're in great shape. Don't let anybody tell you, I, I, this makes me crazy, that, you know, the era of great playing is over and that there was a golden age and now we're in the copper age or the lead age or whatever age we're in. And that, you know, everything today sucks and that nothing is as good as, you know, performance blah, from way back. None of that's true. If we really believe, if we truly believe that these quartets are great music and that their greatness has to do with their perpetual relevance to us as listeners, their constant ability to withstand numerous interpretive, interpretive approaches and to withstand repetition, then we must believe, we must, that the best performances are even today still among us, among living musicians, and we only need to keep on listening. But we're not quite at that moment because... I think it's just important to make that point. However, however, my favorite version this week, and I mean this week because like I said, as you can see, it's an embarrassment of riches. We are drowning in great quartet playing. The crisis of classical music, as I've said so often, is not is not that there's something wrong, that there isn't enough, that young people aren't listening to it, none of that. The crisis of classical music, if indeed there is a crisis, is that we are drowning in greatness. There is too much stuff out there, too much really great stuff out there, and it, how do you keep making room for more and more and more? What criteria do you use to decide between one fabulous performance and another fabulous performance? Do you wind up just just nitpicking tiny little details that make no difference? These are all the issues that these Beethoven quartets raise. Even beyond the music itself, they are they are emblematic of so much that's happening in today's musical world and the issues that we have to grapple with as listeners. We're lucky. We can listen to anything we want. Tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of it. And if you see people who say such and such is definitive or so and so is the best and everything else is garbage, please ignore them. They're nuts. 
They're just not listening. They've turned their ears off. They've turned their brains off. They've turned their feelings off. They're just embittered. <laughs> and there's no reason to be bitter, but there is reason to be sort of like puzzled. And what are we going to do with all this stuff? And my favorite this week is the Smetna Quartet on Superfun. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to play you a sample to tell you why. The opening of the first Razumovsky Quartet, Quartet Number no. 7, which is sort of my go-to. Whenever I get a new cycle, that's the first thing I play. Because, first of all, the playing of the cello is so critical in all of these quartets. And I prefer a quartet sound that's slightly, slightly bass heavy. I want to hear a firm bottom on the sound at all times. And the cello has to have as much personality as the first violin in all of these quartets without without question. If they don't, if they can't balance each other, then the whole thing isn't going to work in my opinion. And then there's the question of the accent, the tempo, the the tension that's generated leading up to that first crescendo, first big crescendo, that wonderful rhythmic fluidity of that transitional motive that you can't hum in correct rhythm even if you try. You know, the one that goes... I mean, it, it's just wonderful, and they nail it. <clears throat> so here, listen for yourself, and you get a sense of the things that I think are wonderful and that I think these people do so well. Here it is. I hope you heard what I meant there. I mean, it's just so great, especially the phrasing of that opening theme, with the cello. Da 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 da. da. Oh, it's just great. I mean, who's who's the cellist here? Do they even tell you? It'd be nice if they do. Yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. It's Milan Schampa. No, he was the violist. What am I talking about? Um, it's Antonio Cahoot. Antonio Cahoot, who had his own quartet as well, and Schampa had his own quartet. All these people had their own quartets. What a group! Unbelievable! Unbelievable. So those, my friends, are my picks for the Beethoven Quartets. An extraordinary legacy, an extraordinary legacy of recorded performances. You know, if the universe comes to an end and all that survives is a batch of Beethoven Quartet recordings, then alien visitors will know that a great civilization once existed here. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. Take care.